joy of having an introduction, which I don't understand will work. So I have no idea what she's told you, and I apologize in advance. My Spanish is horrible. So I'm not going to even try and embarrass myself tonight. But um, thank you very much for having me. Um, everyone's been really gracious. Uh, it's, it's been a great day, and, and certainly I'm very excited to be here tonight. I, I need to admit to you, I started the day in meetings where I need to wear a suit and a tie. Um, and now I still have the tie, and we've dressed down a bit, and I was going to lose the tie. But if you understood how long it took me to put on the tie, I really made an investment here. So I hope we all enjoy the tie, and there you go. Um, and I hope my wife is proud of me for being successful. So, all right, so let's dive in. We're going to talk about data for a couple of a couple minutes, and I'm going to give you a bit of an overview, but before we dive into that, um, how many people here know OpenTable? Super. I don't have to explain what it is. So why is OpenTable important? It's because this is my background. So I am not the typical person that's going to come and talk to you about government and data. I, I grew up in the startup world. I, was I came from the Silicon Valley. So in the late 90s, I was one of the people who started a company called OpenTable. And um, I spent seven years building that. I'm a computer scientist. My focus is on technology. And um, I spent those seven years where, you know, the first year, it was essentially your typical startup, a bunch of dudes in the basement writing terrible code, and everyone hated it to seven years later, it became a multinational company, and we ended up doing really well. Now, why is this important? It's because I realized um, of certainly a big event in the US with 9-11, right? So I realized on 9-11 that, sorry, it's coming out. Um, I realized on 9-11 that I didn't want my entire legacy to be about restaurant reservations. Right? So I imagine this was before my wife and I had kids, and I envisioned a situation where my future kids came to me and they said, Daddy, what do you do? And my response was, well, I help people go out to dinner at fancy restaurants. And that seemed like the wrong thing to say, and that wasn't how I was raised. So post 9-11, I tried to figure out what should I do. Now, I knew I didn't have to do anything fast, but I knew that when Open Table was ready to be done with me, and that when she had grown up and everything was great, I wanted to give back to my community. And so I took a couple of years to figure out what could that be. And originally I thought it would be really easy. I'd volunteer in the winter of Chicago, and if people haven't heard Chicago's cold in the winter, and check on homeless folks, right? Something important. Or I could you know, work for a charity or do something like that. But then um, there was an article in the New York Times and it talked about how big city police departments were recruiting white collar professionals to work in their departments in post 9-11 efforts because they wanted to bring these technical and analytical skills in because the threats had changed. And it just clicked with me. I'm like, I think I have some skills, I know about the computer thing, and you know, I know a little bit about data, and maybe I should do that. So I did the craziest thing that sort of a startup guy could do, who comes from Boston, and did lots of school and all that, I took the police exam. So, and it's important when you realize, like, when I joined the Chicago Police Department, I took the police exam, I went through all of the screening, I went through everyone else who wanted to be a beat cop. And, um, you know, the process, interestingly, to become a Chicago cop takes two years. Like, the steps are, you know, you take this big written exam, which I love taking written exams, so it was great. Um, but then you get drug testing, you have to do a physical fitness test, you do another physical fitness test, you get a psych test, you do all this. And then one day in 2006, I get a letter saying, you're going to start the police academy in a week. And that's when it became real. Because remember, I'm at like Oak Table, and we have snacks, and beer 30, and wonderful things like that. 
And then the academy. So my wife and I talked, and we decided I'd do it. It was time. Open table was big. We had everything that worked out. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I joined the Chicago Police Department. I went through the police academy. Um, important note for anyone who is thinking about going to the academy, you have to do a lot of push-ups. And I hadn't done any before. So this was not super awesome. Um, so I go through the academy. Um, I graduate at the top of my class. And I, the, the thing about the CPD is when you graduate at the top, you get to pick where you can go. This was another controversial point, because my wife's family said, well, because they're from Chicago, I'm from Boston. They said, well, you're going to pick the safest neighborhood. And that will be fine, and we can humor your little police time. Um, I picked the worst neighborhood in the city. I picked the west side. Um, because I figured if I was going to be the police, I should really be the police and learn the job. So fast forward to this. I worked in the field for a while, and then the CPD realized I had graduate degree in computer science, and I got reassigned to headquarters, where I was given the autonomy to build a new unit. And the idea behind the unit was, how do you use advanced data analytics and machine learning to predict where people would be killed? And so my job for a couple of years was solely to take data and every day decide where we should send units because I thought there was a higher probability of someone being shot or killed in target. So what's the important lesson here? The important lesson is you have a classic institution like the CPD which has a ton of data, has a lot of history, but business was done in an old way. Now, in the US, we can see Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google all doing really smart things, right? We use the data to do smart business, yet we were doing things the same way for 20, 30, 40 years. And we challenged that paradigm. And what came out of my time at the CPD was, you can use data to do business smarter, and at the end of the day, we prevented people from getting killed. And it was a new type of approach. So after five years at the CPD, my wife and I were like, OK, that's not play time. Um, and I had promised her that I would only do five years in government. Um, and then so I was going to a new startup. And it was super awesome because I was still kind of young, not really young, but kind of young. And I was going to go do it again because startups are awesome. Um, and then what happened in Chicago was Rahm Emanuel was elected as mayor. Do people, is Ron commonly known down here or not? A little, but not a lot. So Ron Emanuel was uh, President Obama's chief of staff. And so he wrapped up his time as chief of staff, and he went in and ran for mayor in Chicago. We had had the same mayor for 21 years, and then Ron was elected. So great, like I didn't really care. Um, I wasn't political, I'm like, I'm gonna go do my startup. But then I get an email on a Sunday night which said, Hi, Brett, can you please come down to Ron Emanuel's transition headquarters tomorrow? And I look at it, and I show my wife, I'm like, what does this mean? And she's like, you can't ignore it. I'm like, yeah, I can make it delete um, But she's like, bad idea. So I go over the next day, and so um, I have no idea what to expect. And Mayor Emanuel, Mayor Elect Emanuel, had been elected on a couple key principles. One had been bringing transparency to Chicago. And then he also wanted data-driven government. Okay. So you know, I was talking earlier, we've all heard about data-driven government before, right? I'm a politician, we're good, data-driven government. But he, he goes to me, he's, he's, he's like, I want to do this for real, and you're going to have the autonomy, and there's a reason I want to bring you in, and I want to create this new position, which hadn't existed in cities before, um, a chief data officer and you'll report to me, you'll be in the mayor's office, and, and you'll have the autonomy to build out a true data program. So I looked at it, and I'm like, well, how do you really say no to that? It's like a first of its kind thing. I can define the job. I have autonomy. I get to work at City Hall, and I kind of like the architecture there. Um, you know, there was a couple new restaurants across the street. Uh, so I decided to say yes. And so we, we immediately jumped into open data. So today we're going to talk about more than open data, but let's, let's start there. So remember, we had a history of not being open. So part of the transition plan was 
we are going to, in 100 days, have an open data program. Now, I sometimes print slides in which I show um, the open data uh, web portal in 2010. It's essentially it's an empty web page. So that was the history of this. So I came in, and honestly, I didn't know a lot about open data. Because um, I didn't work to close data. When you're working on predicting homicides, you're not really working with very open data at that point. So I'm like, okay, we'll learn about open data, and I'm like, I think open data is good, and then we'll build out a data program. So you end up, and I hate this picture. Um, so, but you end up with the, this media coverage where I'm like, what happened to my head? Um, and so you end up with this sort of media sensation around it where Chicago can't be open. So here's a principle that I'd ask the group to think about. Um, one of the things I encountered in the very beginning of my career as a political appointee was people told me all the things I couldn't do. And which personally I find very motivating. Um, the more you tell me I can't do something, the more I'm going to push back. Um, so people said we couldn't be open, people said we couldn't use data, people said we couldn't release data, people said it was all campaign rhetoric. Um, so I started to come up with this plan on how would we approach it. Now there were different parts of it. Um, one was we'd start looking at Open 311. Are people familiar with 311? Yep, super. Um, we create an API um, and we have Open 311. But then we would start to build out a portal. And now here's the important part of having a data portal. I wanted to build it in an automated way. Data portals which rely on some dude or dudette who is going to post data in a manual fashion are not sustainable. So my design from day one would, and I think we have a bit of a technical crowd, was to write ETL software. It was going to just be on the system and it would run and people wouldn't really know where it was. So once you do that, how do you turn it off? Um, so, and then we'd start to look at how do we bring together the data from all of the different siloed systems. Now, for many of you here are very familiar with government and some of the problems we have. So, government, if you look at the past couple decades, they made a big investment in technology. Some will argue good, some will argue bad, but it was often done at the department level. Now, what happens when you build technology at the department level is it is a silo of data because it stays within its system, right? Whether it's from bureaucratic, logical, systems perspective, database perspective, it is siloed. Now, an obvious sort of problem with that is are, are cities problems only within departments? No. So, like, a fun question I like to poke grad students at the University of Chicago, and, and I'll say to them, is crime a problem about the police? Okay? So everyone, everyone looks at me, and they're like, that's either the stupidest question I've ever heard, or it's a trick question. So half always raise their hands, because they're sort of hedging their bets. And then the other half don't. But the reality is, what, what is crime about? Crime is about abandoned buildings, and social service, and economics, and budgets, and graffiti, and garbage pickup, and yes, the police. But if you look at all the things I just ticked off, that's how we build technology in those little features. So how are we going to break that down? Now, my, my approach for how to get Chicago into the open data scene, I was somewhat conflicted. Now, do you ease it in, or do you have a big move, right? Now, one of the things you may or may not know about Mayor Emanuel, my former boss, is he likes to be the best. So I figured I would some support. So my decision was to make a very big move. And my focus was on crime. Now, crime data in Chicago, before we started this, was not accessible. Your best case situation was the Chicago police would have a public facing map that would show points on the map, and it would show the past 90 days. And so people would write little software, they'd scrape it off there, they'd try and create a data structure, but crime changes over time, so it would never be updated. So I thought the way to really break into this was to make a huge crime move. So what's the move? 
were to release 4.7 million rows of time data in the day before. So let's talk about the story. Um, so before, the number was zero. That's my starting point. Um, and then when we looked, so this is 2011, and I said, we're going to release all crime data going from January 1, 2001 to present, and we're going to do it overnight. And we're going to get onto the open data scene immediately. There was some controversy here, because what does this introduce into the problem? Um, the technology you can figure out, right? It's You're extracting data from a warehouse, you're posting it, we use Secreta. Um, as a platform, you have to between CKN and Secreta. Secreta was easier at that point. Um, but what's interesting about 4.7 million rows of data, so in a typical data release, maybe you release 10,000 rows of something, right? So what do you do if you're risk adverse? You have your interns or you have your fellows check every line, right? Safety net. What happens when it's 4.7 million rows? Like, that's a lot of intern. Um, and we didn't have that many interns. So this is now a new risk proposition where you're saying, we're going to release something that we couldn't check every line. And we did. And there was controversy. And the funny thing is um, that overnight, the world changed. So the Associated Press picked up the crime report. And we got enormous coverage. Like, I'm getting calls from New Zealand and Australia to do live interviews about Chicago on the open data scene. And from that day forth, we went from having an empty web page to now we have one of the biggest open data presences out there. Now, what are the lessons there? One, taking risk. Two, sustainable smart technology. But three, there's actually a good message around it. Because in Chicago, we had a history of not being transparent. And now we go to being a leader in the space. So when you think about open data, open data isn't just about the data release. It's about all of the different constituencies. It's about getting open data out to your civic community. It's about getting it out to researchers, your academics. But it's also about getting politicians and bureaucracies comfortable with it. I am not thrilled about situations with open data where you don't have that full win proposition. Like you need to understand your constituencies, bring them in, and now, interestingly enough, open data has become something that Chicago is very proud of. And the amount of calls we get from jurisdictions saying, how do we do what Chicago did, amazes me, considering where we started in 2011. Um, last week, I was in Kansas City on a panel. And they're early on. They're just starting. And it's, it's, we're starting to see more and more jurisdictions who are, who are starting to sort of put their toe in the water there. And there's huge potential, but we need to remember to give wins in order to make this sustainable. Um, but at the same time, so you start to think about how do you take it beyond transparency, right? And so I'm kidding because we actually put out a book, Beyond Transparency. Um, but you can leverage this data to make systems better. And at the end of the day, we want to make our cities better and we want to make our cities smarter based on all of the data we have. So let's talk about a, a project we call Windy Grid. Um, so Windy Grid is a homegrown product that, that came out of the mayor's office in Chicago. Now, what, what is it and why did it happen? So in 2011, I'm put in as chief data officer, and in the first couple of weeks, I get a briefing saying, we have the NATO summit coming to Chicago in May of 2012. So this is going to be the biggest external event that Chicago's seen since 1968. And the 1968 event had gone really poorly. So I looked at the event briefing, and I'm like, oh, that's great. OK, I'm going to work on my whole data thing. Great. Right. A couple months go by, and I get called into the chief of staff's office. And I'm asked the question, saying, do we have situational awareness? So for those of you who are not experts in situational awareness, situational awareness is when you have a system which takes together all of your different disparate data and says, what is happening in a place 
right now. Okay? So we're at a location now, and you can say, what are the police cars that are nearby? Has anyone called 911? Are there any disturbances? Where's my garbage truck trucks? All of the different city services. But if you're going to run a big event, like an Olympics, like a NATO summit, a G8 summit, you need to have this. Chicago didn't have this. Problematic. So the chief of staff says to me, she's like, you know about that whole data thing. What are we going to do? Now, your typical options for a city of size is you're going to do a competitive procurement. You're going to look at the vendor landscape, and you're going to say to the big companies, I need to do this. I can spend about $20 million. And that's a real number. Like, that's the kind of money these things cost. And you'll do a year-long bid process, and they'll take a year or two to build and then you'll go live. So my reality is I really had nine months to go live. Um, last I checked, I didn't have an extra $20 million. And um, I somehow now own this problem. So what do you do? So the nice thing is we're technologists. Many of us are technologists here. We're like, we know how to work with data. And where do I go? I go to the open source world. So, and what I started to do is I, I looked at big data platforms and I realized that I wanted to take all of this historical data, put it into a big uh, NoSQL big data platform, and the best options were in fact open source. So in the mayor's office, we started building a MongoDB cluster. So literally, imagine the formal mayor's office of stacking up computers and Distributed cluster, and what we did is we started sucking in all of the spatial data from all of our transactional systems into this cluster. And we, you know, I started to have this epiphany. I'm like, I'm not going to do anything else. I'm going to build this. And we put together a small, agile-minded team, and we started to build the system. And this is a, a screenshot from Windy Grid. And so what happened over the next nine months is we actually built a distributed through Chicago system, which had ETLs to all these systems, all the data that came in centrally. I built a massive spatial index, and we had all the data we needed coming in within seconds. So if someone called 911 for a disturbance, two to, two to five seconds after the operator entered the, the record into the, the dispatch system, the Windy Grid system would have it. Now, halfway through this, I had this epiphany, because to be clear, this is not how Windy Grid originally looked. Original, originally, Windy Grid was like on a Unix screen, and it had JavaScript as an interface language, and I had this moment where I'm like, this speaks really well to me, but maybe not to normal people. So, um, so we then leveraged our uh, GIS platform, we built a layer on top of it, and what does the system do? And this is now used, uh, it's been used citywide in Chicago for a number of years. It, one, you can create, so this is what I would call an ad hoc polygon, a, a shape that you're monitoring. You say, what do you want to see? And all the data flows directly in, and you see it within seconds, your situational awareness. But two, and probably more importantly, it lets you have a deep dive of the data. Now, one of the things that drove me nuts is when I would want to look at historical data and I'd call up the IT department and I'd be like, hey, I want to look at five years of data and I just access it. And they'd say, well, it's in the archive on tape. And they're like, when we keep in the relational data system, it just slows down, so we ship it off. That made me crazy. So when we built this new platform, we kept all the historical data. Imagine the power of when you are a policymaker or an administrator or trying to solve a problem, and you can look at a location. So the address of City Hall in Chicago is 121 North LaSalle. You can look at 10 plus years of data and with a return time of approximately six seconds, and you can analyze it. A whole different way of having data available for policy. Now the fun thing is, from the beginning, I wanted to be able to share this. Um, and so the intent was always to open source it. So this year we put, to, put it into a package we call OpenPrint, right? And hopefully this is a familiar website to folks where it's all up on GitHub. 
you know, the idea of building a system that is enterprise stable, can take all of your data and then post it in GitHub, is a new way of thinking about data-driven government. Because this challenges the too hard, too expensive, too all of the above paradigm. And this is something we're very proud of because it shows the power of data. But the subtle piece, which is hard to show on the slide about Windy Grid, is great. You have a visualization layer, you have a deep dive layer, but what's the most important? You have an API to Windy Grid. So if I am a data scientist and I'm spinning up R or something like that, I can do a direct call into there and get any data I need to work on any sort of problem. And that is the real power of a system like this. Because if we're going to realize this idea of data-driven government, we actually need the data, you need it now, you need it available, and you need it normalized in some shape or form. So when you think about the talent, um, it's just the needs of government in the past are different than what we need today, right? So when I went in in 2011, um, you know, you really had these three different groups. You had the policy folks, you had an IT department, which were essentially order takers, and then you had a very classical approach to statistics. It was take the data, the data better be super clean, um, up to sort of publication standard, and we'll use classical techniques. If you brought up the term machine learning, that was not part of the vernacular. So what we realized is we needed to start creating cohorts of people who could traverse these worlds. Like we found with me, with some work, that I could take computer science and bring it to the policy realm. But the components we see are this computer science, machine learning, and then public policy. And one of the things we're really excited about at University of Chicago, and it actually turns out some folks here are going to be attending this, is we create a little degree. Um, we created dual great computer science and public policy. And this is something that initially they thought was completely nuts. But this is what we need as we look at future iterations of government. Um, but other things, so we talked about situational awareness. Um, we talked about bringing data together. But there's some interesting use cases because at the core of, of city business, things are not always exciting. So in Chicago, um, an area of focus is identifying food violations. And this started because some folks were sort of telling me these terrible stories of getting food poisoning and this place is horrible and all that. Now the way that most cities deal with food poisoning or general services like this is a either a complaint is called in or there's a regular inspection schedule. Now for all the data scientists in, in the room, um, you know that a batching you know, process the standard queue is not terribly efficient, right? You're not using any sort of intelligence, you're not saying, who should I prioritize? So what we did is we started to look at the problem and say, how can we queue in a smarter way? And what are high risk attributes that you might find that allow you to have a smarter ordering? Now, this is the fun part of data science. You have folks who come from the deductive mindset and others who are inductive. Are you going to test in a hypothesis or something you think, or are you going to accept that the data might tell you something new? And we found an interesting hybrid when we did this. We found that using business licenses, sanitation complaints, those are kind of obvious. But when you look at the fact that the garbage outside was an indicator and potentially overflowing garbage, that's less obvious. And when we, when we implemented the system, we found we could identify violations substantially faster by using what, in my mind, is basic data science to improve this. So we could find the violators earlier, we could prevent poisonings, and we could remediate um, various uh, restaurants that were having problems. And the problem set here, like it's a very narrow one, but this is how we need to operate government going forward. Because you have certain realities that you need to accept. Government will have finite resources. In this case, you will only have X number of inspectors. What is the best use of X? Just saying we've always done it this way and first in, first out is a way to do this is not acceptable. 
in this age of data. And this is an easy example of a low cost win which changed how we did business. Now, when, when you think about how do you get there, because the question I frequently get is, what are the components that help me be successful? Um, and I come down to three things. One is I had strong executive support. So Mayor Emanuel recruited me in. Mayor Emanuel is a strong mayor, and he was very clear on how he wanted to run government. Um, he, his mandate was he would be supportive of me, and I would get the job done. Got it. Two, technical experience. So something that drives me nuts in government is the reliance continually on outside parties. Now, I have no problem le leveraging outside vendors. I have no problem with commercial products. But you need some inside knowledge, because you need to be able to call nonsense when there is nonsense. And what people rapidly learned with me is if you said to me, one, it's too hard or it can't be done, we're going to dive into every detail until I prove you wrong. Or the classic example of the estimation of a job. I, I love this example in which someone told me that it would take eight weeks to get something done. And I said, we'll do it together. And it was then done in two days. You know, there's this challenge in which we work in. And but having that knowledge rapidly changes the paradigm. And you show that you're a government that understands what you're doing and is going to be honest brokers in play here. And then there's this piece of risk tolerance. It is very hard to go into government and be risk adverse, right? Um, I went, if, if you're going in and you're risk adverse, your focus is going to be on continuing your career, not making a bad choice that could implode you. My view going into government and what I told Mayor Emanuel was, I would do what I, what I thought was right in order to accomplish these changes. And if I ever made a critical mistake, then it's fine. I'm pretty sure I'll find another job and you can let me go. Uh, now that may sound a little flippant, but when you go in and you want to make change, you need to cons not be constantly worried about protecting yourself and protecting your career. Often the safe move is not the smart move, and you need to be able to make the smart move. So when we, we look to the future, a couple things that I just want to tease on before we, we go to Q&A. Um, we have this project, the Array of Things. So there's a lot of talk in the world these days about sensors. Like, we, we have sensors everywhere. Everyone here, I'm sure, has a cell phone. A couple of you seem to have two. Um, you know, there's just devices everywhere. We have data everywhere. People are on Twitter, Facebook. Our cars talk, IOTs and everything. You know, apparently my refrigerator is going to know when things are expired. Super. Um, so a project we're working on at the University of Chicago and at Argonne is this array of things. These are these fixed place sensors um, up here where we're putting them, we're starting out by putting 50 um, immediately in a variety of blocks and they essentially have a sensor board. And you're able to collect everything from all sorts of weather data and climate data to traffic to congestion pollution. And the idea is, um, and this is important and it gets at how I think about cities. We sometimes think about cities in terms of uh, a city holistically or a city in terms of neighborhoods, street segments, because different parts of the city act in different ways. You have these micro geographies and until you understand them, um, it's hard to make what I would call tailored treatment. So this is an interesting project. Now, um, now, when you put up a sensor stack in the city, that brings a lot of questions here. And an area that I think is very important, and you can consider this with my background in open data, are issues of privacy. And how do we be transparent about what we're doing? So if you were to Google the Array of Things right now, you'd find that all the hardware plans are open. So we are putting all the plans out in the open, and all the data that they collect is going into the data portal. Because I wrote a piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago which talked about the world of sensors as we push ahead needs to go hand in hand with transparency. 
But when you start to look at projects like this, we need to find the synergies between those two because the value of the data is going to be enormous. This is going to allow us to work on asthma, congestion, you name it. These are critical things. Early detection of flooding. These are very exciting projects, but we as a community need to be talking about them so that we're able to do them in a way we feel good about rather than being projects that we are concerned about or afraid of. Another project which is a lot of fun at the University of Chicago is what we call the Weather Crime Project. So someone made the mistake a year and a half, two years ago, of saying to me that weather doesn't influence violent crime. So I'm, I'm like, I know this is wrong. So what do you do when you're with the University of Chicago and someone says something, you do a project, right? Um, and, and so the idea was, how can we leverage the enormity of weather data and how can we take crime data to build smart predictive models? And the funny thing about this is um, this is data that's all open data. So for this system, this is driven by census data that we have available in the US, all of the crime data, which I just happened to release in 2011, and then weather data, which um, one of our federal agencies releases terabytes of weather data. It's hard to use, but um, we invested the work into building this. So what are you looking at? So again, this is a pretty picture on top of some complexity. So we suck in all of the weather data, we suck in the crime data and the census data, we deal with it all spatially, so every point has a spatial bound, and then we push it into a neural network. Um, we built this on top of the Argonne National Lab supercomputer, which is one of our big national labs, it's partnered with the University of Chicago, and what we did is we predicted hour by hour, based on spatial attributes, you know, where the violence would occur in Chicago. So from zero to 72 hours, we have a model for each one of these, and every hour we re-predict. Um, and then the nice thing about this is when you introduce in weather, your accuracy improves substantially. But the funny thing about weather, because I, I know there's a profound interest in weather and crime in the room, um, is that it's not just about straight weather. It's not when it's hot out, there's crime. We found that it's changes in weather. So we created this whole subset of the data which calculates the changes. It's all these calculated values. So if it's 50 degrees yesterday, sorry Fahrenheit, um, and it becomes 75 degrees today, your slope increase is substantial. That slope is more meaningful than the actual temperature. And you find all of these things. So when you start to think about this based on resources, you start to say, how do I drive a smarter city? So everyone here has been exposed to the idea of smarter cities, right? You see these really great commercials where like the sidewalks move and wonderful things are happening. Not there yet, um, but with all this data, remember, open data, you're able to do really, really smart things that can actually help the city operate in a smarter way in highly accurate, operationally useful techniques. And again, if you go back to the other slide, remember what I said about microgeographies. If I started to think about things, like right here is a whole neighborhood, but I clearly don't need to worry about right there. When we put things together, it dilutes it. We need to be thinking about our cities in a microgeographic way, and we can make smart, tailored decisions. Uh, and this is super exciting. So to sort of tie this together, you know, I do want to leave you with these key themes. Like many people in the room are thinking about how they can be impactful. And there's lots of cities that can provide lessons that sort of help you think about that. But think about all of these pieces and think about all the sort of strengths you have, but then think about who can provide that executive support and your own personal risk tolerance. Thank you.